Okay, um, I make it um, 10 to 1, and for once in my life, I've got more than 20 slides, so I'm going to crack on um, and hope that we can get through them all uh, by the end of the talk. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, those of you who don't know me, my name's Gavin Judney. Um, that's my alter ego, uh, Director of Technology at the Consultancy. Uh, and I am here courtesy of my fabulous colleagues and friends, um, Alan McKenzie, who's down here, Alan Pulvinus, who's at the back, and Sarah, who may or may not be in the room, who collectively make up Transform ELT. And you can visit their stand down in the Exhibition Centre. So the first thing I would like to do is, is wonder a little bit about why you're here. Now, I'm not going to ask you to chat about why you're here, um, because clearly there's not enough time, and I actually think I know why you're here anyway. <laughs> so I'm going to cut out the middleman and just, as, as I go through some of the possible reasons why you might be here, if you recognize yourself, give yourself a little chuckle of recognition. Oh, just like that. Um, <laughs> So the first one is, I think the reason you might be here is that every day you go into the place where you teach, the school or university, and every other class is putting on their VR headsets and <laughs> heading off into virtual worlds and technology experiences, the likes of which you can only dream of, <laughs> because you're in the next room doing the present perfect. <laughs> From a book. Yeah, everyone's doing it, folks. You must have seen these people. You've probably got some family members sitting at home with their headsets on. Don't ask what they're doing. It's best not to know. That's one reason. Some of you I can see are already chuckling. <laughs> the second reason is that, you know, now that all your students are living in augmented reality, you're feeling that maybe you're missing something. You know, why haven't you got the... Uh, Terminator glasses. Why aren't you seeing house prices flashed up in front of you while you walk down the street? Where are your QR codes to scan to, to get to the listening? Why is your life so dull? But worse than it's not just this. I mean, this you could cope with, but the worst thing is that gradually your job's disappearing. Because Alexa's come along, and it's utterly brilliant, and it's actually going to replace you. You're going to be replaced by bots and AI assistants and chatbots. And, I, I mean, I don't mind at my age, I don't much care, you know, because I've only got a few years left in me, so <laughs> it's fine. But you guys, some of you, I can see some of you are young. I, anyone under 50 is young for me these days, so don't feel too smug about that. Um, but you may well just feel that you've, you haven't been disrupted enough. <laughs> your, um, your school registers don't use the underlying blockchain technology to keep track of student movement around the school. Your centre has not got a bot policy in place. Shame on you. <laughs> and, and frankly, you need to be disruptive. So what is disruption? When I was um, putting together this talk, my very good friend and colleague, Philip Kerr, who's not at the conference this year, but whose blog is one of the best and well-informed blogs around, uh, particularly with regards to technology, he produced a blog post called The Jargon Buster, which had a list of concepts with definitions. And um, I'd like to share with you the definition for disruption. He says, disruption, a word used in utter seriousness by people who dream of getting rich from the privatisation of education. <laughs> and I think we can all go with that. That's fine. I mean, it's a good starting point. There may, it may be slightly more nuanced than that. But we'll go with that. Now, I'm going to run through some key concepts. You'll probably be familiar with them. So I'm going to run through them really quickly, much to the annoyance of Victoria, who's live streaming my talk and has to click the slides the same time as me to keep up. So the first one, I just wanted to remind people of the Gartner hype cycle. You'll all be familiar with this. It's, um, it's a diagram that describes pretty much the way technology happens. You get a, a technology trigger at the bottom, everyone gets excited, and everyone's, yay, smart boards, woo. And, um, 
And, and they go screaming up to the top, the peak of inflated expectations, and then the rot sets in. Because they look around and actually everyone's using their 2,500 pound smart board to show YouTube videos. <laughs> which they could have done for 400 quid from Amazon. Uh, and gradually that beautiful excitement dissipates and you end up rather like in a Harry Potter film, I suspect, I've never seen one, in the trough of disillusionment. And it is oh so hard to get out of the trough of disillusionment. Almost impossible, as we'll see. Some people make it, some people gradually find another use for the interactive whiteboard, generally PowerPoint. And, um, <laughs> and they creep up the slope of enlightenment to um, the plateau of productivity. But it doesn't always happen that way. Let's take AR as an example. This is where AR is on the chart in 2010. Okay? And this is where it is in 2013. You can see what's going to happen here, can't you? You've already got a good idea. 2013. 2015, a little bit of a kick. 2017. 2018. And in 2019, it's disappeared. Why? I, we'll come back to that. VR, the new kid on the block, not mentioned in 2010. But by 2013, it's in the trough of disillusionment. <laughs> How did that happen? How did that happen with such brilliant technology? Since then, it's been crawling slightly up, very slowly, to 2017. It's somewhere between uh, disillusionment and enlightenment, which I suspect describes most of us on a normal day <laughs> anyway. But in 2018, it's not there anymore. What's happened? So this is an interesting, the way, the way these technologies come and go is really interesting. Um, there are a couple of things I'd like to, because there's got to be a serious bit. I know we're all here to have fun, but there's got to be a serious bit. So I've got a couple of quotes. We'll get through those very quickly. Um, by the way, you'll be able to download all my slides at the end of the talk, okay? I mean, they are handcrafted, and I spent a long time on them. So um, I just want to draw you to, your attention to a couple of people. Levy first, who talked about our uh, bee-like tendencies to buzz between the flowers of new technology and often to throw um, older technologies and older approaches out on a whim um, as a new shiny object came along. I'm not going to ask you to read it all, because it will be on the slides. Um, and also to this concept, I, um, the dearly departed uh, Stephen Bax, whose uh, concept of normalization of technology, of making technology a normal part of what we do, is one that's incredibly dear to my heart, at least, and lots of other people. And he's a sad loss to our, he was a sad loss to our profession. OK, so those are key concepts. Get it out of the way. Let's go back to the laughing. Let's look at disruptions. I'm going to be looking at three disruptions. Augmented reality, virtual reality, and AI and bots. So, um, VR. What does Philip Kerr and the jargon buster have to say about VR? It's a short definition. It says, technology that makes you dizzy. Um, and if any of you ever tried that, you may find that quite familiar. But not everyone is as negative about VR um, as Philip is. In fact, the Huffington Post says, Vir virtual reality, the new and sexier way to learn languages. Um, now, I, I learned a really good punchline for this off Lindsay Clamfield last night, but I'm not going to tell you because he'll be using it in his plenary tomorrow morning, <laughs> and that would just be rude. Um, so, virtual reality, the new and sexier way to learn languages. Down on the chalk face, Sean's not in here, is he? Sean? He's outside filming. This is Sean when I spoke to him recently. At the moment, it's a little bit gimmicky at the moment. Is VR useful for language learning? Well, perhaps not. And I really struggle, and have been struggling, over the last two year, year or two, to try and find where VR does sit in language learning. If he'd been here, I would have told him to stop struggling. <laughs> just, just move on. Um, but is it, is it that huge? Is virtual reality that huge? How many people are, have got a VR headset at home? Just put your hands up if you... Oh, wow, wow that's, that's uh, 4%. Um, brilliant. <laughs> um, VR sales are dreadful. This is the IDC. 
reporting that worldwide shipments of augmented reality and virtual reality headsets were down 30.5% year on year, Q1 2018. The VR market has contracted 33.7% in Q2 2018, compared with the same period in Q2 2017. But light at the end of the tunnel, with the recent launch of the Oculus Go, a new standalone headset, IDC predicts that VR headset market will return to growth this year, ultimately reaching, and this is an extraordinary huge number, 65.9 million units by 2022. Just to put that in perspective, that's 0.83% of, percent of the global population expected in 2022, or roughly the equivalent of the population of France. And I like to amuse myself by imagining the whole of the population of France wearing VR headsets. <laughs> and everyone else go, what? <laughs> um, so sales, sales are rubbish. No one's buying these things. If they are, they're, they're not being used for learning languages, let me tell you. Um, what does the literature say? Well, I did a, an EBSCO search on virtual reality and headset and language learning, and I found 645 academic results, which I thought was amazing. In the first 100, only six of them referred to language learning with VR headsets, and a large proportion of them uh, referred to learning languages in virtual worlds, like Second Life, rather than headsets. Where they weren't talking about Second Life, they were talking about what you might call STEM subjects or, or, or um, subjects where virtual reality might make sense, like architecture, being able to look around a building, history, being able to wander the Colosseum, those kind of things. And if you look at the people producing what are somewhat distastefully known as VR experiences, <laughs> um, you'll find that there's, there's, there's nothing really or very little being produced for language learning. You'll see all these things, and they make sense, I think, a little bit. Historical times, um, countries and buildings, all those kind of things, they do make a little bit of sense. Um, this is class VR. If you look at uh, another one, Unimersive, you'll see that they're doing kind of history and that kind of stuff. On the language side, I mean, this stuff actually does look quite good, I have to say, when you're not feeling dizzy. Um, on the language side, we have some um, pretty disastrous things. I, I won't be able to share, um, play the videos for you because I want to move on, but they're all linked in the, um, in the slides. This is Lingua Practice VR, uh, a YouTube channel where you can uh, wander around 360-degree rooms learning vocabulary like cutlery. I think so. <laughs> and as I looked at it, I thought, blimey, that's a lot of work for teaching cutlery. Because <laughs> I could have taught cutlery in a very short amount of time compared to that. Um, this is learning languages in VR. This is fantastic. Examples include ordering a baguette in Paris, <laughs> buying a bento box in Tokyo, or trying tapas at a Spanish restaurant. Immerse Me will prepare learners with the practical language skills they need to thrive as a global citizen. But if you look at those examples, you know, ordering a baguette in Paris, buying a bento box, you think, what's the difference between that and buying a phrase book? Do you know the answer? About 250 quid. <laughs> um, more or less. It depends on the headset you buy, obviously. Um, this is Mondly. Now, Mondly are different because they employ solid neural science. <laughs> ah, yes. And they're combining it with cutting-edge technologies uh, to get you talking new languages faster than anyone else. Isn't that amazing? Not, not launched yet. Uh, and in the example... You've got someone saying, what type of room would you like? And you can choose from, I need a single room. I would like a room with a bathroom or a room with a shower. <laughs> I refer the learned gentleman to my answer before. Um, this is um, Paul Driver talking about VR. It says, as it stands, off-the-shelf VR programs aren't likely to do much to further the students' language learning abilities. For the most part, students have no control within these environments and little social interaction. Superficial uses of the technology, cutlery, 
will click, quickly lead to the novelty wearing off while neither doing justice to the learners or the potential of the medium. Uh, or, as campus technology put it, study finds no difference in VR learning outcomes compared to other modes. Um, Paul Driver's done some fabulous stuff with 360 video and teacher training, where teachers can, are filmed uh, doing their CELTA training, and then they can watch themselves in VR helmets and look at their students and look at their board work, and that, all that's lovely, but the rest is just rubbish. Okay, moving on, augmented reality. What does the jargon buster say? about augmented reality. It says it's an out-of-date interactive technology with no convincing classroom value. CF, interactive. Sorry, this is not a joyful talk <laughs> at all. Uh, uh, back to Sean Wilde, and Sean says, there aren't many specific language learning AR apps. I don't think it's something which is necessarily geared towards language. There's a theme here, can you see, in Sean's explorations. He's, he's basically doing all the hard work for us, trying out all the technologies and coming to the conclusion that we did without spending the money, which is, well, you know, good on him. Good on him. It's not going to be something which gives lots of language practice. Um, and just a simple uh, example from uh, publishing. Um, Huber Verlag, traditional Bavarian publishing company specialised in language learning textbooks, has been creating augmented reality apps designed to allow students to access audio and video files related to their lessons. Students can simply use their smartphones to scan a textbook page to reveal the related digital content. Well, whoop de doo <laughs> I say. Um, if, if all we've got out of AR is that you can scan a QR code and do a listening, I think we do need to go back and examine it a bit more closely. Okay, how are we doing for time? Excellent. So, AI and bots. A bot, according to the jargon buster, is a non-unionised cheap teacher for the masses. Now, we, we hear a lot about bots and language processing and the, the amazing strides that have been made in language pro processing. Um, and I thought, well, hey, I'll try it out. So I went to try out Mitsuku, who is a four-time winner of the Lerbner Prize Turing Test, the world's best conversational chatbot, as featured in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, BBC, Guardian, Wired, and more. So I thought, let's see. I said, um, I said, do you think chatbots are the future of education? It would seem a natural part of evolution that robots replace humans in the future. I see myself as part of that. But okay, fine. What is the future of language learning then? You are talking to her. I didn't, I promise you, I didn't manipulate the text here at all. So I thought, well, that's brilliant then. So let's delve a little deeper. I said, um, I'm having some problems with the present perfect. Can you explain it to me? And she said, is there anything I can do to help? Your polite style is very nice. You're, you're so smart, you tell me what it is. I said, the present perfect. I said, thanks for the info. <laughs> the future, the future's looking bright. I'll, I'll, I'll just finish it up. I said, um, can you help at all? <laughs> With anything? What's wrong? If you ask for help in the form of a question, learning, I'm learning a little bit there about the language. Um, I might be able to solve your problem. I said, can you explain the present perfect to me? And she said, perfect equals complete in all respects, without defect or omission. Sound, flawless. And I thought, present perfectly, I thought, I've never heard such rot in all my life. Um, 
Philip, who did the jargon buster, has written quite extensively on chatbots uh, and, and, and artificial intelligence and language learning. And um, although it seems like we're very close to something very exciting there, we're actually not at all close to something very exciting. And he points out this, which is, which is uh, a good explanation, is that, that, that we don't have a domain knowledge model, that artificial intelligence works on domain knowledge models, and it's therefore very good at di diagnosing things like why a carburetor isn't working, or stuff like that. But we all know that famous, um, can you fool the Google Translator thing of um, time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. And, and that's just that's a silly example these days of what is a very complex problem. And that is we don't know enough about language and how it's learned for bots and artificial intelligence to actually uh, make a difference. And, and the top researchers in this field acknowledge that we are a long, long, long way away from this. A long way. Um, Philip also says, in a nutshell, we simply don't know how to build a machine that can truly understand human language. Limited exchanges in restricted domains can be done pretty well. But despite recent advances in semantic computing, we're a long way away from anything that can mimic a real conversation, and a long way away. Um, it's not all bad news on the chatbots and, and, and AI, though, because they are apparently very, very good at learning to be sexist, racist, and all sorts of other things. So all's not lost in the artificial intelligence field. <laughs> They're very good at appearing to be artificially intelligent like other people in the whole, on the whole planet. Um, this was a Microsoft chatbot called Tay that was taught to be racist in 24 hours just by reading enough rubbish on Twitter. Uh, and this is um, another headline which I loved. Um, New AI fake text generator may be too dangerous to release. Yes, perilous grammar. So... Look, we've, we've looked at artificial intelligence and art, uh, sorry, artificial reality, virtual reality, artificial intelligence, but you're all here because it's a technology session. So what is the real reality? What is the reality um, out there in the field? Well, the rea reality out in the field is that, that really the only technology that makes sense, it, it has some kind of basis in mobile. Um, Philip's jargon buster says mobile learning is chatting or playing games with your phone in class. But the reason it makes sense is that unlike VR headset sales, which have all been to the entire population of France, mobile phone sales are increasing year on year. Currently, 2019, 67.1 of the world's population has a mobile phone. That's a massive amount. And of those 67.1%, 63.4% of them are connected to the internet on their mobile device. These are huge numbers. This is normalization in practice. Um, and it's, it's not so economically um, bound as any other technology we've had. You have cheaper phones, you have widespread availability, developed and developing countries. Um, you would be very surprised if you looked at the statistics for individual countries, how they vary hugely um, if you compare them to, say, GDP, for example. But the fact is that when most people get a little bit of money, especially young people, they spend it on training shoes or a mobile phone. And that's why we have such ubiquity. And that's why they make sense. And I think, unlike the kind of hyped technologies of AR, VR, AI, and chatbots, mobiles are ubiquitous, or at least getting there. And you won't find a, an interactive whiteboard in everyone's house in the near future. Um, they're also normalized, at least outside the class. Mobile phones are normalized. People are using them on a daily basis to perform all manner of tasks. Um, in a lot of classes around the world, we remove their mobile phones so that they can't perform all manner of tasks in our classrooms. They're not limited by subject or discipline mobile phones. They're very, very malleable, I think, subject-wise. You can do all sorts of things on a mobile phone, not just language learning, all sorts of fabulous things. Um, they're not wedded to outdated methodologies. Like VR, v stepping into a VR language lesson is like going back to the 1980s, only the graphics aren't as good. Um, so they're, they're not wedded to any kind of methodological approach. They're not dependent on a domain knowledge model. 
Because what they are really dependent on, I think, is mobiles are dependent on teachers and good teaching. Um, and the use of mobiles is entirely compatible with a teacher's current practice and methodological approach. Um, that's real reality. Now, I do have um, hmm, well, five minutes left. Perfect timing. So um, I am going to ask you to say hello to the na your neighbour next to you. And on the next screen, I've got all the terms that Philip Kerr has in his jargon buster. I'd like you to pick the one that you particularly despise more than any others and tell your neighbour. OK, here they are. I'm going to uh, stop you there. The, um, so I got all the way through to that point before the um, drone-based disruptive thought leader actually went out of the room in a bit of a humph, so um, I've, I've offended at least one person in the talk. Um, what's the conclusion? My conclusion... <laughs> I don't know. Aww. Um, my conclusion is that actually disruption ain't what it used to be. We've had two periods of disruption. The first one was good, and that was in the mid-2000s, mid and that was teachers, and it was an educational disruption. It was people exploring technologies and figuring out what to do with them, and we had some amazingly creative practice during that period. The second period of disruption referred to by Philip is an entirely financial-driven disruption, and it's going in completely the wrong direction and it's taking the soul out of our classrooms. That's my conclusion. If you've got anything happier, do feel free to, to share it on our, our Facebook page where we've been li live streaming. Folks, it's been lovely. Thank you very much. If you want to download the slides, please do. They're there. Uh, my thanks once again to the three folks from Transform ELT who have sponsored me, and um, do please go down and have a look at their stand. And if you're interested in the work that Nikki and I do, there's some publicity here or at the back on the chair. And I finished two minutes early. Thank you very, very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, it was yesterday. It was yesterday. Happy birthday to you. Aww. Happy birthday to you. Aww. Oh. Happy birthday to you. Oh.